Our next speaker is Timothy O'Connor from Indiana University, who is not only um, currently editing a volume on Brutus' faith and intellectual virtue, but he's also the Philopong World Grand Champion. Um, and the Philopong World Champion. The best ping pong player among philosophers in the world. <laughs> Seven years running. Seven years running, exactly. Um, and his, uh, his topic is um, multiverses, theodicy, and the incarnation. All right. Uh, like others before me, I want to thank our hosts uh, for bringing us to such a beautiful place uh, and for some of the really great papers um, that uh, I've been able to hear. Um, this uh, in the past couple of days. Like HUD, I'm not a Leibniz scholar. And uh, as I understood it, I was recruited to sort of riff on Leibnizian themes or ideas and to, and to argue that they are not solely um, matters of historical scholarly interest. They lead to arguments that we should take seriously today. Uh, my topic is the Christian doctrine of the incarnation, which Leibniz, of course, accepted. Uh, in due course, it will become evident um, how reflection on this doctrine leads me in Leibnizian directions, not unlike uh, one of the directions that was featured prominently in HUD's discussion. Okay, so traditional Christian, Christians affirm the doctrine of the incarnation, the doctrine that God became human as the man, Jesus of Nazareth, and hence that Jesus is God, in some sense. The doctrine developed over the course of the first few centuries of the Christian faith. During that time, weaker and less metaphysically puzzling alternatives were ruled out by the councils, various councils of the church. Alternatives such as that God only appeared to be as a human, uh, that Jesus was only an especially God-conscious human, or that the divinity of God and the humanity of Jesus were somehow strongly correlated for a time but not really bound together in a single individual. Why have Christians opted for the strongest and hence least comprehensible conception of the incarnation? The incarnation serves certain divine purposes, purposes that would not have been served had the divine human nexus been less intimate than the orthodox position specifies. At least two, two divine purposes seem relevant here. First, most Christians hold that the incarnation is essential to the rescue, op op excuse me, the rescue operation that God brings about in Jesus. Christians understand the details of the rescue operation, which they call the atonement, in a variety of ways. On one conception, the death of Jesus expresses a righteous judgment of and restitution for human sin. In offering that restitution on our behalf, Jesus makes it possible for us to be forgiven and to be restored to fellowship with God. Jesus could appropriately serve as our representative in this way only if he became one of us, our elder and blameless brother. On a second conception, Jesus' life, death, and especially his resurrection can liberate us individually and communally from the captivity of sin and its destructive consequences, including death itself. On still a third conception, Jesus' exemplary, self-denying, love-filled life and voluntary suffering of an unjust death provides the only model for a fully formed human life and unleashes a power of love that has the potential to transform us. Finally, uh, the Eastern Church teaches that the union of the human with the divine in Jesus and his subsequent exaltation paves the way for us to gradually partake of the divine nature. On all these models, and I note that, importantly, they are not mutually exclusive, we must cooperate with God in some manner for these benefits to flow to us. The chief work of the atonement is wrought by Jesus, but we must respond to and appropriate it. Also common to all of them is that if the union between Jesus' divine nature and human nature is less than complete, a prerequisite for God's purposes for the atonement of humanity fails to be satisfied. Uh, for some, the necessity here is merely conditional. According to them, while it is fitting that God chose the incarnational path of atonement, he was free to do so in other ways. I take at least Aquinas to have that view. A second divine purpose that the incarnation serves is enabling God's experiential identification with human beings. God comes to know directly and fully what it is like to be human including some of our greatest joys and our darkest sufferings. 
and thereby affirms human nature as uniquely, profoundly, and intrinsically valuable. What is so special about human nature such that God would wish to so identify with it? The Genesis creation narrative states that humans are divine icons, image bearers of God. It, this is interpreted by many theologians both as a recognition of certain intrinsic features of human beings, such as our capacity for rationality, for self-awareness, for freedom, or for self-emptying love, and as a gift befitting, though not perhaps necessitated by, those same features. The offer of friendship with God and the promise of an eventual fuller realization of our potential. At any rate, the incarnation demonstrates that human beings, in virtue of bearing the, the divine image, hold a privileged place in God's economy to such an extent that God deems it worthwhile to actually take on human nature. Now, let us suppose that the doctrine of the incarnation in its ecumenical fundamentals is coherent. And of course, many have been convinced that it isn't. And let us take it to include both of the claims I just indicated concerning the divine purposes for incarnation. Even so, both modern scientific understanding of the scope of created reality and plausible theological reflection in a Leibnizian vein, as Leibniz himself may have recognized, uh, pose a prima facie problem for the plausibility of one aspect of the doctrine, its claim of uniqueness. Uh, trying to read my additional notes here. Uh, much hangs here on what uh, the constraints, uh, um, sorry, no, um, yes, okay, sorry, I, I, uh, I, got, I got lost in my little scribbles in the margin. It turns out, I needed to say this first, it turns out that humans inhabit a vanishingly small fraction of known spatio-temporal reality. Might there be creatures elsewhere in our cosmos that satisfy the intrinsic conditions for bearing the divine image? This matter is much debated in astrobiology. For all we know, it could be that the probability of the appearance of divine image-bearing, uh, henceforth dib, creatures is so small that it may take a cosmos 100 billion light years across and 14 <coughs> billion years old to generate a single dib species. Much hangs here on what the constraints on life turn out to be, and this is still not fully understood. Uh, here's a fun fact that I learned just last week and is also relevant um, to our focus on the Lis Lisbon disaster of 1755. Plate, te plate tectonics, which are responsible for earthquakes, are now thought to be essential for recycling the atmosphere and regulating the temperature of life-sustaining planets such as Earth. For this reason, I, uh, I've read by someone who I think is a reputable scientist, for this reason, Venus, Though uh, within the habitable, what, what astrobiologists call the habitable zone of our sun, um, uh, cannot sustain life. It is unbearably hot and has an overburdened atmosphere for want, precisely of the oceans and plate tectonics uh, system that we have, um, both happily and tragically. Uh, and uh, further, um, okay, so I'll just move on. But likewise, for all we know, the universe might be richly populated with creatures capable of self-awareness, rationality, freedom, love, and so forth, uh, to the same or far, perhaps far greater degrees than ourselves. And that's just when we co contemplate the confirmed scope of spatio-temporal reality. Recent scientifically motivated multiverse hypotheses explode the scale of contemplated physical reality to a nigh unimaginable degree. For those who suppose that such cosmological theorizing has a significant measure of empirical support, this too is hotly debated. The epistemic likelihood that many other dib creatures' kinds exist will be significant too. But there are also philosophical come theological reasons stemming from Leibnizian reflections in the outline um, uh, to suppose that reality is a great deal larger than the domain of human observation and influence. Leibniz is surely correct that a being who is necessarily infinitely wise and good will always act for a reason, and indeed, where such is available, for the best reason, all things considered. 
God's actions can bear no trace of sheer caprice or arbitrariness. Among God's actions is the creation of our universe, whose composition is rife with seemingly arbitrary values. The total number of stars, the precise ratio of fundamental particles, the exact speed of light, and so on. It must have been good for God to create our universe, else he would not have done so. But it seems that it would have been good also for God to create a universe of a more or less uh, different fundamental character. There is not time to fully explore this matter, so I will limit myself to some brief remarks. Leibniz held this to be the best of all possible worlds, believing that the infinitely wise God would be able to solve for the optimal balance of good-making features of possible created realities, analogously to the way that one may solve for a minimal or maximal value of a curve or size of a region in calculus. In particular, God would solve for the maximum value of a world with endless variety that is governed by extremely simple fundamental principles. I want to note that this general approach is not inconsistent with its turning out that a very large, possibly infinite, multiverse be the desired solution. Uh, and for my purposes, I'm going to be thinking about multiverses as uh, universes that are individually spatio-temporally spatio um, connected totalities, but that are not um, uh, causally connected to one another, save in their common origin in God. And indeed, there is, to my mind, a plausible argument from incommensurable, uh, incommensurable goods for such a conclusion, although it is one that Leibniz could not accept. While our universe plausibly is very good in some respects, in orderliness, in beauty, in its capacity to give rise to morally good, morally free creatures, at least some of these goods may well come at the expense of other possible goods, kinds of structured complexity inconsistent with the kind exhibited in our universe and corresponding kinds of beauty. That is, these other possible goods and certain actual goods could not coexist within a single universe governed by uniform natural laws. If this is so, uh, we might well be disinclined to follow Leibniz in thinking that the overall value of universes with incommensurate individual goods can nonetheless, in every case, be ranked with respect to each other. And if we do so, we are probably dissatisfied with Leibniz's highly abstract understanding of metaphysical perfection as the determinant of God's choice. So where does that leave, it? leave it. Where does that leave us? We should, I think, go with Leibniz, at least to the extent of saying that God would be disinclined to pick one value over another arbitrarily. He would do so only if forced to choose. But, I know, he needn't choose between the <coughs> options that uh, I've been broaching as he might create the best of every class of possible universes whose members are commensurate in value. That is, you might think of possible universes as falling out not on one single great chain of being, right, but on a branch, branching structure. So all universes that are relevantly similar can perhaps be ranked, possible universes can be ranked with respect to one another, but distinct branches, there, there's no value comparison between them. They're just too disparate in the kinds of values that they manifest. Right? And then you say, God, so God looks at the whole branching structure and says, I'll take the, the top value of each of them. This collection of top valued members would, it seems, collectively constitute the best possible world. Quite possibly, many of these universes possess the value of containing dib creatures. Remember, divine image bearing creatures. But many depart more radically from Leibniz by rejecting his view that there is a best possible world. Um, I don't have time to go into reasons why you might reject that, but suppose for the moment that he was so mistaken in thinking that there, there, there is a best possible world. Perhaps for each or some of the value-ordered branches of commensurable universe kinds, there is no top value corresponding to one or more of the kinds. I think that this scenario, too, points in the direction of a multiverse, indeed of an infinitely membered one. For it is hard to credit the thought that a perfectly wise being of limitless power, contemplating each of the, we're now supposing, infinitely ascending branches of the creative possibilities, should just arbitrarily reach up and pick one from each, fully aware that whichever one he picks, no matter how far up the scale he goes, uh, there are others of enormously greater value than it. Again, if he had no choice but to make such an arbitrary selection, I, unlike Leibniz, would be willing to suppose that he might well do so. 
but he did have a choice. For he could choose an appropriate threshold of goodness and create every one of the infinitely many universes above that threshold, or every other one, or every millionth one, uh, doesn't matter. So there could be a scope for contingency of, of a pretty strong sort here. Not that Leibniz would want that sort of contingency. Uh, but in this case, almost certainly, infinitely many of these universes possess the value of containing div creatures. For reasons like this, Christians have strong, though by no means definitive, scientific and theological reasons to, to at least leave open the possibility that there are other div creatures in existence. But if so, it would seem that the divine purposes behind the human incarnation would also apply to these beings. Supposing any of them were in need of rescuing of the sort that Christians believe we are in need of, taking on their natures would presumably be a prerequisite for such saving work among them. And even if no rescuing were needed, the second divine purpose, identification with the lives and experiences of his dib creatures, would apply anyway. In response to this suggestion, a Christian might say that God's incarnation in Jesus of Nazareth serves these pur purposes for all dib creatures. After all, human persons vary considerably, yet God's incarnation as the particular man, Jesus of Nazareth, serves God's restorative and identificative purposes for all of them. Why not for all dib creatures then, human and non-human alike? There are a couple of reasons why uh, it seems to me this is an unsatisfying response. First of all, it suggests that we humans won an incarnational lottery, that we alone, for no apparent reason, were chosen as the recipients of God's incarnational act. Here again, Leibnizian worries about arbitrariness loom. Why would God choose us rather than some other dib species among which to be uh, incarnated? I'm going to have to pick up my paper to read my very small scribble. Uh, something like this worry is perhaps tacitly acknowledged by Leibniz in a text that Paul pointed out to me a couple days ago. So in part one, section 18 of the Theodicy, uh, in criticizing an unnamed proponent of a rationalist astronomical theology, Leibniz remarks, it does not appear that there is one principal place in the known universe deserving in preference uh, to the rest to be the seat of the eldest of created beings imagined in this astronomical theology. And the sun of our system, uh, at least, is not it. Um, in any case, uh, uh, though I, 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 I want to note that on this particular point, um, Christian theology teaches that the particulars of Jesus' incarnation a lowly birth among a despised minority group in a cultural backwater were particularly fitting circumstances for the one who came not to be served but to serve and to be an example to us today. Um, but in any case, not all philosophers of religion seem to be terribly troubled by radical divine arbitrariness. Bob Adams contends that there is no moral obligation to create the best and that a choice by God of less than the best can be adequately accounted for in terms of divine grace a disposition to love independent of the value or merit of that which is love. And Mike Ray has recently suggested that the oft-troubling fact of divine silence vis-a-vis -vis his human creatures may reflect in part God's personality, his preferred mode of interaction, uh, rather than anything about um, the depth of his concern or love for us. I may have one or both of these authors wrong, but they seem to be suggesting that there may be idiosyncrasies to God's personality characteristics that have no integral connection to God's other omni-attributes. For my part, I can't attribute idiosyncrasy and the, and the contingency that seems to flow from it to God's character, given the necessity of his existence and his bearing the traditional omni-attribute. <coughs> A second problem for the suggestion that God's incarnation as the human Jesus serves God's purposes for all dead creatures is the epistemic ignorance in these cr creatures of Jesus' life and work. work. While it may be that God's purposes for other dib creatures can be served without their knowing about it, Christian devotional practice reflects the view that an awareness of God's redemptive work is a great good for us, a source of comfort and joy. Well, maybe you buy the foregoing reasoning, and maybe you don't. But even if there happen not to be any dib creatures, save human beings, 
or there are, but the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus serves God's purpose for all of them, there, there is still an underlying metaphysical issue worth exploring. Whether or not it is within the scope of an omnipotent being's power to take on more than one dim creaturely nature. Might God have been multiply incarnated? If so, how might this work? I hold that a viable metaphysics of the incarnation has the consequence that multiple incarnations are indeed possible. Here I can but sketch a way of modeling this and consider a few objections. I suspect that there are more and possibly deeper objections uh, to what I suggest, and I hope that you will uh, help me to identify them more clearly. All right, so section one, how to be an incarnate deity. As with the doctrine of atonement, so with the doctrine of incarnation. All traditional Christians affirm it, but there is much disagreement concerning how to understand it. Okay, talk of understanding it when we're talking about the, the incarnation may be a bit much uh, regarding the, the sketchy theories um, that are offered by philosophers. Um, the core thesis is that the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, took on a full human nature so that he became a single person having two natures, human and divine. Prima facie, this is incoherent. On it, uh, as at least certain of the essential properties of divinity and humanity seem incompatible. I will not aim to settle that fundamental issue here. Instead, I will merely mention three sorts of theories of incarnation, and there are others, without any attempt to thoroughly elucidate them and their attendant difficulties. I'll then indicate the one in terms of which I will consider the possibility of many-natured incarnation. Uh, my inexpert reading of Leibniz's discussion of the Incarnation lead me to think that his view is of the same general sort as the one that I'm proposing, and thus that multi-incarnation multi is consistent with his understanding of Incarnation. Um, I gather, though, he nowhere contemplates um, such a possibility explicitly, although if someone knows of a place where he does so, I'd be eager to hear about it. All that I claim about the, the theory that I'm going to sketch is that it seems to me to be free of demonstrable incoherence. It certainly does not dispel all mystery surrounding the incarnational doctrine. All right, so on the canonic theory, God the Son rel relinquished certain of his properties, for example, omniscience and omnipotence, in becoming human. This makes it very straightforward to interpret statements in the New Testament where, for example, Jesus claims not to know a fact, the date of the last judgment known only to God the Father, or is said to have grown in wisdom as a child. A major downside of this view is to make sense of the idea that God could cease to be all-knowing, or that a divine person, I should say, could cease to be all-knowing, and so on. Certainly it is a non-starter for one who accepts the so-called Anselmian philosophical understanding of God as essentially a maximally perfect being. So moving on, on the alternatives to Mind's theory of incarnation, in becoming human, God the Son acquired a distinct and human mind, one whose range of awareness and knowledge was limited in all the ways typical of human, human minds. The consciousness of the one person, Jesus Christ, was centered during his earthly life in his human mind, uh, at least on some developments of this idea, which had quite limited access to the divine mind, whereas the divine had full access to the human. In response to the worry that this threatens the unity of the divine human person, an analogy, an analogy is sometimes drawn to the ways that theory and contemporary cognitive science posit relatively autonomous cognitive subsystems in the mind of ordinary human persons, <coughs> the contents of some of which are more directly accessible to conscious awareness than others. Finally, there is uh, the compositional theory, or rather a family of compositional theories, a certain version of which I favor. A rough statement of such a view is given by contemporary theologian <coughs> Dr. Chris. Quote, in the incarnation, we are dealing with a divine person that has expanded, so to speak, to include a human nature. The expanded divine person owns his human nature in the way similar to the manner in which I own the limbs of my body. They are parts of me. In an extended or stretched sense, the human nature of Christ is a part of the second person of the Trinity. The core idea here is that in taking on a full human nature, mind and body, the single divine person becomes a composite thing or substance. I'm thus taking natures in, in this context, somewhat controversially, to be concrete particulars. 
So he is the self-same person, retaining all the omni-attributes of divinity, but now has and expresses two natures, each of which are distinct components of his being. As you'd expect, there is a thorny issue here connecting this picture of the incarnation to the doctrine of the Trinity, according to which God the Son is a person who is one substance with the Father and the Holy Spirit. It might seem that the divine human composite substance that, I suppose, is the incarnate Jesus Christ could not be one substance with the other persons of the Trinity, a holy immaterial being. Uh, let us not pause, uh, let's not pause to try and finesse that puzzle here. Um, Though I, I, I'll note that I agree um, with Leibniz that to avoid contradiction, we must reject the um, common scholastic view of the so-called communi communicability of the properties between the two natures. I, I think Leibniz was exactly right about that, that you gotta give that up. Um, where we go from the core idea in developing the compositional theory depends in part on how we think of human persons. I, should, I follow neither the many Christians who thought or think of humans as immaterial substances, uh, nor medieval Aristotelians such as Aquinas who thought of them as matter-form compounds. Instead, I hold that human persons are wholly material, materially composed individuals who have a kind of unity that not had by garden variety material composites. This unity is conferred by our having strongly emergent mental capacities and properties which are metaphysically basic, not physically realized, features that make a non-redundant causal difference to the way the world unfolds. In the familiar older lingo, my view is a substance monism about the human person conjoined with a strong form of non-epiphenomenal property dualism. It's interesting for me uh, in this connection uh, to note that Leibniz saw a problem in his mere aggregation of monads view of the human body uh, in application to the incarnation. Where he, and specifically in thinking about the incarnation, he worried about the adequacy of his official view about the human body. Uh, and I want to thank Maria Rosa for pointing me to his uh, course, late, very late correspondence with the boss about just this issue. If Christ himself is to be a true unity and not a mere aggregation, it seems that more needs that, that there needs to be a substantial bond with, with, within his human nature, beyond his, his official picture of a colony of monads and their modifications. Um, so Leibniz kind of wrestled with that, seemed to think, yeah, maybe we need some further kind of substantial metaphysical relation uh, going on there, um, but he never officially endorsed it, I gather. So, uh, and if worried to do so, it would, it would look even more like my, my, my picture. On my preferred version of compositionalism about the incarnation, when God the Son became incarnate, he simultaneously created and absorbed into himself a human embryo which, as it matured, expressed increasingly significant cognitive capacities and properties. That developing embryo, fetus, newborn, youth, adult, was and eternally is not a distinct person from God the Son, co-Trinitarian participant in the creation of the world. It was and is an instance of human nature, a living, fully intact human body, but one that is not in itself a person at all. It is a part, the human part, of the one person, God the Son, latterly known as Jesus Christ in virtue of the incarnational event. Now, an important task for any would-be full-blown compositional account of the incarnation is to specify the relation holding between the components of his divine human being such that they are substantially unified and together constitute a single person. Uh, in agreement with most Orthodox theologians, Leibniz himself included, I doubt that this task can be fully accomplished. We human beings lack the conceptual resources to fully penetrate the mystery of the incarnation. But some things can be said that go a certain distance. One, adequa one adequacy constraint on such an account noted by Leibniz, is that it entailed that the human component of the one individual is, in principle, not separable from the whole individual in such a way that it would thereby constitute a purely human person in its own right. Uh, not, not all uh, traditional uh, discussants of the incarnation um, held that view. Some of the medievalists wanted to say that, well, were the human nature of Christ to be somehow separated from uh, him, then we would thereby now have a, a, an autonomous uh, human being in existence. Uh, and and I, I think that that's the wrong way to think about it, and I'll explain why 
as we go on. I suggest that persons are individuated by their both being a center of subjectivity, subjective experience, awareness, and being the wellspring of the acts that they perform. In other words, sameness of person entails sameness of subject and sameness of agent. Typically, an instance of human nature will include, in itself, a proprietary center of subjectivity and agency. A properly formed and functioning human body is sufficient for the emergence of an autonomous, experiencing subject and agent at the center of a dynamic, phenomenal, intentional manifold. But were the human nature of Jesus to include a proprietary human center of subjectivity and or agency, we should have on our hands a complete, solely human person, or so it seems to me. I think Leibniz would agree. So I conclude that Orthodox Christology requires that Jesus' human body does not give rise to a proprietary experiencing agent. Um, and this is the point where I would depart from typical defenses of two mind theories. Yet the Christological creed of Chalcedon makes things difficult because it also teaches that Jesus had distinct and unmingled human and divine intellects and wills. To square these claims, that is what I want to say with, with the, the official creedal statement, I suggest that the one person, the Son, somehow operates through his human intellect, experiencing as subject the purely human phenomenal intentional manifold, and through his human will, initiating in some distinctive way the human acts of will that then operate in the characteristic manner of human action. Pulling the threads together, the eternal Son of God is a divine person having essentially the divine omni-attributes. At a particular point in time, he co-created and in a mysterious manner grafted into himself a living human body such that it was from its inception his body. Like other properly formed living human bodies, his body also exhibited, in the fullness of time, the attributes of human finite personhood. It was an unfolding sphere of changing finite perspectival, phenomenal intentional states, in short, of intellect, and of limited agency, will. But while there are two sets of distinctively personal capacities of intellect and will, human and divine, there is but one person. For there is a single locus of subjectivity and agency anchored in the divine mind, which is manifested in part through the, the embodied human mental capacities of Jesus of Nazareth. In this way, Jesus is fully human, while being metaphysically unique among humans. All right, section two, how to be a multiply incarnate deity. Consider the person known as Jesus of Nazareth on earth and as Joshua of Namath on Gliza 581G, which is, uh, I, according to what I've read, the nearest planet outside our solar system in, what, uh, in a habitable zone uh, of its solar system. And consider the suggestion that these apparently distinct persons are in fact the very same divine, multiply creatured person. This requires the possibility that one person can occupy two widely uh, separated spatial regions. But note that it is not a case of multi-location of bodies, whereby one wholly material object wholly occupies more than one spatial region. And that's a good thing for such Multi-location, though toyed with by some recent physicians, is a highly problematic idea. For the two bodies of Jesus slash Joshua are distinct objects, parts of the one person who lives through them. As I said a moment ago, on the incarnational picture I propose, these bodies, instances of human and Glesian nature, having mental as well as physical attributes, are inherently dependent entities, not proper substances in their own right. But insofar as we do think of them, in isolation from the one individual they partly compose, they are wholly distinct. To whom or what does Peter refer when he points and says to John, there is Jesus? I take it that he refers to the person Jesus. So, if multiple incarnations are the case, he unknowingly refers to a person who is also, and perhaps simultaneously, occupying a planet far, far away. And if he says, there is the body of Jesus, he makes, at least on a natural disambiguation of what he says, a mistaken assum assumption of uniqueness. For the person Jesus has more than one body. Now, if he were philosophically savvier than we have reason to suspect the uneducated fisherman from Galilee really was, 
he could say truly, there and only there is the human body of Jesus. Now, you might sense a more troublesome oddity when we turn from the body to the mind of Jesus on this picture. If Jesus of Nazareth is the very same person as Joshua of Namath, the thought goes, then Jesus' mental states would seem to be very confused. He would be thinking, for example, John is my beloved disciple, and Giles is my beloved disciple. But this thought itself rests on a confusion concerning the doctrine of incarnation. Jesus is the incarnate Son of God. He has a fully divine and fully human mind, and these are distinct ranges of thought of one person. The restricted human mental life of Jesus will have no access to the Gleesian thoughts of Joshua and vice versa. The human mind of Jesus will presumably not even include awareness that he is incarnated on Gleesia 581G. But the eternal Son of God is, in his divine mind, fully and simultaneously aware of all the thoughts flitting through both of the creaturely minds associated with the names Jesus and Joshua, that is, his creaturely minds. And this is just a special case, a special kind of inside knowledge, owing to his being incarnated as Jesus and Joshua, of his knowledge of all creaturely thoughts in creation. There is, I suggested, but one center of subjectivity in this multiply incarnated divine person. We might think of the divine mind's awareness of the limited creature, creaturely minds of his many incarnations by a very loose analogy to our own awareness of the distinct deliverances of multiple sense modalities centered in a single subjectivity. There are, of course, sharp processing limits for us, but it's conceivable that these could be increased to a degree that would make possible a phenomenal intentional manifold of a complexity we cannot imagine. All right. So now a brief and final section three, a theological worry, Mike's theological worry, and, and uh, thanks to HUD for not stealing my thunder. According to the current proposal, if the Son of God can take on a human body, mind, uh, as a part of himself, he can take on, and perhaps has taken on, the natures of a potential infinity of other dib species, without its being the case that any physical thing is multi-located, throughout a single universe or among many, and without fragmentation of the divine mind, which serves as the sole center of subjectivity and agential control of the creaturely minds resulting from the many incarnations. Even if all this is granted, one might object that this proposal generates as many theological problems as it solves. I will discuss just one such worry, that the actuality of multiple incarnations is incompatible with the Christian revelation. A number of off-cited New Testament passages seem to imply that God's redemptive purposes for all of creation are served by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That is, by the actions performed by the Son of God via his human nature. So says the author of, Col of the epistle to the Colossians, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And the writer of Ephesians adds that God's will is, quote, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. But the cohesiveness and comprehensiveness of Christ's redemptive work that these passages assert is undermined by my proposal, or so goes the objection. If there are many dip species, and the Son of God redeems them and identifies with them by taking up each of their natures individually, then the acts of Jesus recorded in the New Testament do not serve to reconcile to God all things. At one level, this worry can be dealt with pretty straightforwardly. Remember that the acts of Jesus recorded in the New Testament and the acts of Joshua recorded in the Gleesian text that is, alas, unavailable to us, are not acts of distinct persons, but acts of one and the same person, the Son of God. So on the picture being broached, it is indeed through Christ that God reconciles all things to himself, just not exclusively by those of his creaturely actions that, are, that happen to be recorded in the New Testament. But it is entirely fitting that the human authors of these scriptural texts would know nothing of Christ's action in distant galaxies or spatio-temporally isolated universes. So my proposal does nothing to contradict what I take these passages to be saying, namely that Christ's incarnate acts in total make redemption possible for all reality, not just for human creatures. However, there is a deeper and more interesting theological problem that these passages raise regarding 
uh, the eschatological picture that they suggest. The New Testament passages are commonly read as suggesting that Christ's work is necessary not only to redeem all things, but also in, a, in an important way to unify all things, to achieve where that includes achieving a harmonious community of all dead creatures under one authority, the Son of God. And I suspect that my proposal is, in fact, inconsistent with this way of understanding New Testament eschatology. There are several ways to draw this out. First of all, community seems possible only among creatures of roughly the same nature, who have roughly similar needs, who flourish in roughly similar environments, who can form relationships with one another, who can successfully communicate with each other, and so on. So given that dead species do not all share a, a sufficiently similar nature, it's hard to see how community among all dead creatures could be possible if there are more than one type. But supposing that God the Son uh, is incarnate in a multiplicity of dip species, prospects for unification look even stranger. First of all, each species will have known him in the dress of its own nature. In which of Christ's creaturely natures would he present himself to a unified community of radically diverse creatures? Any choice, choice would be arbitrary. Alternatively, one might urge that the Son of God would not need to choose, because in the eschaton, in the age to come, he will be known by creatures through his divine nature directly, without the mediation of any creaturely nature. On this scenario, creatures will be transfigured in such a way that direct, spiritual, purely spiritual encounter with God is possible. If so, it should be noted, perhaps this transfiguration will also serve to overcome the radical differences between dim natures, such that a unified community then becomes possible. The trouble with this option is that it seems to violate one of the purposes that motivated God's becoming incarnate in the first place, according to Christian theology, namely identifying with creaturely natures in, the, in, their, in their peculiarity. It strikes me as odd to say that God so deeply values human nature and poten potentially the nature of other dip species, that he deems it worthwhile to take it on and then proceeds to transform that nature into something unrecognizable as distinctively human. It seems more in keeping with this valuing that redeemed creation maintains its diversity. So I propose instead that distinct dip species, if such there be, retain their distinctiveness. Disparate, disparate universes, if such there be, remain forever disjoint. I contend that it is consistent with the New Testament passages that I cited to anticipate unity within each individual community of dip creatures with, with Christ as Lord of all such communities and with each community retaining its God-affirmed peculiarity. I'm done. All right, so we have about half an hour for discussion and I'll make a list of names, so keep it heads up. Thank you. Um, <coughs> um, I got a bit lost uh, as to the motivation uh, of all this, uh, because uh, it seems to me that uh, it is uh, difficult enough uh, to uh, try to give an account which is not uh, logically inconsistent uh, of what it has been uh, accepted, uh, at least by the uh, main, uh, mainstream uh, uh, Christian uh, teaching of the incarnation uh, of God uh, as uh, it is claimed, it is uh, attested uh, by the Gospel and by the early tradition. Uh, and it seems to me it is difficult enough to do that without uh, then going into this uh, hypothesis. And uh, I would uh, actually commend a much more minimalist uh, approach when it comes to the incarnation, uh, which seems to me it is actually Leibniz's approach, uh, which is, uh, well, the best we can do is uh, to show that there is no logical inconsistency in uh, uh, specific uh, formulations uh, of the dogma of the incarnation. It does that to something which is uh, similar, very similar actually to um, contemporary uh, relative identity sort of uh, machinery. And then uh, the other thing is, uh, well, uh, um, people uh, who on the basis uh, of the um, long uh, uh, ecclesiastical history of uh, embracing, endorsing this dogma are uh, largely justified in doing so, as long as there is no um, demonstrated uh, um, uh, 
contradiction, uh, and uh, insofar from his point of view, which I can present uh, a metaphysical model uh, of the incarnation uh, as uh, uh, taught by the tradition, which is not uh, in contradiction uh, with certain metaphysical tenets, which I embrace. So it seems to me that uh, that's big enough, uh, to, uh, a big enough project. I, I, I struggle to see what is the driving motivation of uh, Going behind that, beyond that. Yeah, um, I, I take it you're correct in pointing out that, oddly enough, Leibniz, you know, could, uh, thought of this as a great arch, one of the great arch rationalists, is um, surprisingly modest when it comes to exploring um, uh, Christian theological ideas and trying to make sense out of them. He, he sets for himself relatively modest aims, as you yeah. say, to show that there's a form of contradiction, and he's content to say it's a mystery. Right. Um, and uh, I and I and to a degree, I mean, I, I think I'm following him in that. Um, in what I'm saying about the nature of the incarnation is a little bit beyond what he would say uh, how to think of incarnation, but it acknowledges that ultimately involves some kind of substantial union of divine and human natures, right? The so-called hypostatic union uh, that we don't really understand, right? Okay, but uh, I'm suggesting that. Um, when we reflect on Christian theological teaching about the purpose of incarnation, and then we begin to contemplate, um, well, just stick for the moment to, to sort of empirically based reasons for thinking there could very well be um, uh, distinct uh, kinds of creatures that are rational, self-aware, capable of, of moral behavior, and so on, uh, much like ourselves, perhaps to a greater extent than ourselves. Uh, in, in the universe, because the known universe, the known universe is so much vaster than what Leibniz figured out. Uh, and uh, you know, multiverse theorizing is taken seriously in contemporary cosmology. That you know, that helps the any further still. That puts pressure, right? There, uh, it depends on how you approach the epistemology of religious belief, but I think that puts pressure on um, a Christian who takes her belief to be to be reasonable. Um, to, to then say, well, okay, so how does, how, how does incarnation sit with that possibility? Does, does, is Christian theology committed to a parochial view, right, that, that can't uh, accommodate the, the very real possibility that there is a vast number of such, um, such creature kinds, right? And so then, so this is a speculative uh, uh, proposal that, well, if, if that is in fact the case, we can, in fact, make sense of it in a way that doesn't distort the fundamentals of Christian theology concerning the incarnation. That's what I was proposing. Um, it's not to say that I know this to be true. For all I know, we're the only, what I call, dim creatures that are in, in, uh, in reality, in created reality. Um, i thinking there was a second part to your question, but did that suffice? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm still, I still find myself a little bit um, puzzled. And it's a very attractive idea if, if, um, um, there, if, if Christ could be incarnated in two different bodies. Maybe I could too. Uh -huh. Be in two yes. different places at the uh, yeah. same time, or at least, you know, it, it may make travel a little bit easier. But, um, <laughs> I'm wondering, you know, more seriously, and this is actually not unconnected. Uh, the, you know, my first question was, well, um, if Christ can do it, why can't I? Not, not in the, you know, I mean that the question is, why is it? What is it about the um, um, person of the Trinity that can do it, that that makes it. Um, 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 different from what it is that I can do. Um, and in thinking about this more seriously, though, um, it made me wonder whether your argument is in something like this. You know, if you can imagine one incarnation, it's no more difficult to imagine multiple incarnations. Um, and if, that, if that's the case, are you really explaining any incarnations at all? Huh? What sense are you really giving on account of any incarnation yeah. at all, as opposed to simply saying, well, two or three or an infinity is no more mysterious than one? Yeah, uh, yeah in a way, what I, what I am uh, proposing is pretty modest. I didn't purport to 
saying, here's how, not now all the mystery of, of thinking of a single incarnation, I, I've removed that for, for, uh, from your minds, and now I'm going to take you further and, and show you. No, what I, what I said was, here's a way I think that is coherent. So I at least, you know, I, I left myself open to people saying, that's not a coherent way to think about incarnation. I'll show you how to derive a contradiction from that. So I did make some language. I did, I did uh, lay it out there that, that there's no, uh, you can't derive any kind of contradiction from this compositional way of thinking about incarnation. Uh, but then I wanted to say precisely that multiplicity of incarnations is not, um, uh, it doesn't raise any additional problems, right? If, if the idea of assuming a creaturely nature is possible for God, that, that God should assume a multiplicity of such natures, well, uh, it's, it's not at all evident that he couldn't. I mean, there are just reference issues that we have to figure out. Who are we talking about when we're talking about Jesus? It turns out we're talking about multiply incarnated uh, individual, eternally God the Son at the same time, right? But once you sort all that out, you can then square that with claims, theological claims, I wanted to say. So, so the main aim was more to say uh, Christian theology could, could readily absorb our coming to learn it wouldn't inevitably look, you know, unduly parochial um, because it, it doesn't, there's no way of, of, of expanding the story consistently such that uh, it makes, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it, it doesn't require an arbitrariness of God's choosing uniquely. But that's only to say multiple incarnations are, you know, more mysterious than yes. a single That's right. That's right. Now, as to, you know, why couldn't you or I um, uh, be, you know, assume distinct natures. Um, uh, you know, well, we're not omnipotent. Um, assuming a nature, what would that be for a human being? So, you know, so, so I can go over there and I see, uh, you know, uh, chimpanzees and say, hmm, it'd be kind of fun to be both a human being and a chimpanzee. So, uh, how would you know go talk I, to I, I, uh, I, I, you? Just want, you just want another human person. Okay, all right, so, so two human persons. <laughs> Well, that would have to be, according to my picture, it would have to be, here's what would have to be true for, for it to be true that you had to, so you, were, you were incarnated twice. Uh, there's a single person, Dan Garber, known as Dan Garber, maybe otherwise known under another, uh, another name as well, um, who is the, the, the subjective center of experience of two distinct bodies, just you know, widely separated, and is controlling directly those two bodies, a single locus of agency, right? That's what it would be. Um, do you know how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, except you could help me on it. No, I, I, right, uh, yeah. So I don't, I mean, we, we presumably, we, right, we, 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 we contemplate perhaps a not too distant future in which we can um, artificially create human-like persons as, as close as we like. That's one thing, but they're distinct individuals. How we would create such persons, what we would have to do uh, in order to set things up, even for the possibility of, it, of, of multi incarnation to be possible, is to create them in such a way that even though they're just like human beings in every discernible bodily respect, that there's an incompleteness. There's no center of subjectivity or agency inherent in that nature, right? Um, that, that, that seems very difficult, mysterious. It seems like it takes the power of omnipotence. Okay, so we have 11 people in the queue. <laughs> 20 minutes, so people could um, ask a pointed question, that'd be great. Uh, Matthias is next. Um, I have a question about um, the single personhood and single agency stuff, because I didn't exactly get it. So you say that God and Jesus Christ are one person, same person, right? And God and Joshua over there is one person, so Jesus and Joshua is one person as well. But they have distinct thoughts, they have distinct wills, they have distinct motivations. I don't see how you can speak of a single source of agency there. I mean, they seem to have very schizophrenic minds. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, right, well, so first stick with the single incarnation scenario, right? Um, on my way of thinking about the Incarnation, in, in the way that's typical of most traditional Christian theologians, um, God the Son does not cease in any way to be divine, meaning he is aware of all truths, right? Including all, all so he has all, all knowledge, right? But Jesus, 
uh, is said even directly in the New Testament text, not to know certain things, to grow in ways that God cannot grow. Right? So it seems like uh, we have so 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 there's a puzzle here, right? This is why the very idea of incarnation may seem incoherent. The suggested solution to the or at least removal of the outright appearance of contradiction involves saying there is a distinctively human sphere of thought that Jesus acquires as part of acquiring the human nature. Okay? And that's a distinct sphere of thought, so very limited in the way that all human spheres of thought are. A distinct sphere of thought from the divine, unlimited sphere of thoughts. Okay? But they're thoughts of one and the same person. Right? Okay? So God, so God the Son is doing something in addition to simultaneous with thinking, you know, knowing all truths effortlessly as, 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 as um, um, omniscient, omnipotent God. God is also thinking through a, a human nature, a living, intact, fully formed human body, distinctively human thoughts. He's, he's experiencing, he's, he's receiving, right, the, the, the kinds of causal signals from the, the human environment that the body of Jesus is picking up. He is receiving them, okay? Uh, and then the thought is, if, now you might have a problem with that scenario, but, but just, so I'll let you follow up. So then the thought is, well, if he can do that via one such creaturely nature, he can do that by a multiplicity of such natures, right? Uh, the, the human sphere of thought is distinct from the Galician sphere of thought. They may have very little overlap, in fact, right? And, and just focusing within those creaturely spheres of thought, there would presumably be no awareness that that uh, the, the, these are these these thoughts, you know, would not be the the, the thought I am Joshua of Namath would not be contained within that um, uh, human sphere of thought, but it would be a thought that God the Son has in His divine mind. Okay, that's now your follow. Very very quick, please. Uh, well, just it seems that. Jesus, insofar as he acts from the thoughts he has as a human being, yeah. acts from a different source as Jesus, insofar as he has acts from divine thoughts. I mean, his motivations are different, the reasons why he does things are different, and I take it that, therefore, it's a different source of agency. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not pretending to remove all mystery here, but I think it's that's why. But I think it's a, a constraint on making sense of the incarnational doctrine that the divine mind be the impetus behind all acts of the human being, Jesus. If not, if you say no, there, there's a human mind that is thinking its thoughts and that is initiating in just the way that any other non-incarnated human individual is initiating its actions. Well, now we have sufficient conditions, I think, for, for uh, personhood, totally within the human nature, right? And so now, now we've got the problem, two, we've got two persons. That's not the doctrine of the incarnation, right? Um, so we, we can't go down that road, and that's why we've got to say that somehow um, those thoughts and, and uh, those, those initiations of action right, emanate from the divine mind, right? But then they proceed via the human psych psychological apparatus, right? So they get they get embodied with, within uh, the bounds of the human body. I think it would be good to distinguish two different suggestions in your paper. One is that um, the second person of the Trinity might have been incarnate in different species in different universes. And the second is that the second person, the Trinity, might have become incarnate in different species within a single universe. Um, the first thesis, I don't have much to say about. Uh, the second thesis, it, interestingly, is a contribution to the field of exotheology. Um, and uh, right. that, it seems to me, um, raises real problems for systematic theology. Uh, you'll want to say that. The second person becomes incarnate again only if the fall here on Earth is irrelevant to that species. Um, presumably you'd think that only if you think that each species may or may not have its own fall. If you think that, well just imagine further evolution on Earth. Suppose there's um, 
what is it, Archaeopteryx that's supposed to be between reptiles and birds or something like that. Well, suppose there's something like that between humans yeah. and the post-human. Yeah. Um, does, does the second person of the Trinity become incarnate for the human and the Archaeopteryx and the post-human? Does the second person become incarnate for just the two? Does the Archaeopteryx have to wonder, am, am I covered by the first incarnation or have I not been fallen? Um, there's a lot of theology that has to be yeah. done. Okay, good. Um, as to your, your, your first um, comment, uh, which was, um, I've lost that, sorry, I've lost that. I've been thinking so much about the second, which is a very good question. Remind me again quickly the, the first issue. Not different the, incarnations in different universes. Uh, no, you're saying within a single universe, this raises a problem because... Oh, you need to rewrite oh, a lot of systematic yeah, yeah, That yeah. was all one. Yeah, um, right. Uh, so, well, I, I, I want to separate two, two issues here. Um, I take it that um, it is not a part of Christian orthodoxy, though it's a part of much orthodox Christian thinking, that God would become incarnate only if human beings were in need of the so-called rescue operation. Right? Uh, that is, uh, for example, Eastern Orthodoxy uh, teaches that even if human beings had never sinned, God would have become incarnate, right? Uh, and it has something to do with, so that, uh, you know, through Christ in his exaltation, we, we follow his path, right? So, and, and you might think, and I, I suggest in the paper, a distinct theological motivation, God's conferring, kind of, you know, emphatically declaring the kind of value in human nature and the yoking himself with human beings, and I think that to be a motivation independent. That he need of redemption. So, so, so that's on that issue. Uh, you are raising a really good question about you know thinking in evolutionary terms. Uh, one species giving rise, one rational, self-aware, res res world responsible kind of species giving rise eventually with, with a kind of in-between period uh, to a wholly distinct species. Um, you know, one easy out is to say God's going to make sure nothing like that happens, you know, or something. Um, but what would we say if no God had no reason? Why to do that? Well, I suppose, um, yeah. Um, I don't know what to. Yeah, I mean, I take it you're saying the problem is yeah, the hardest for the in between, the transitional phase, right? Because it's all a sharp cut off. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. That's a good question. I mean, I, I think I take it that when a new species is sufficiently distinct, right, uh, emerges, then people that are clear cases of that. Now we're dealing with a whole new, a whole new ball game. Um, but the in between the transitional phases, those are hard. And yes, a, a related worry. Um, uh, once you've opened the door to these multiple incarnations, then the allocation of one per planet can start to seem a bit arbitrary. Yeah. So you know, if you're going to allow that the different, different bodies can be expressions of the divine mind, then you might want to allow that uh, there could be different prophets in our world all performing this salvation role. And um, indeed, there were people in the 17th century who thought that uh, you know, they had a bit of God in themselves, yes. that everyone had a bit of God in them. So uh, there, there is a slippery slope here. Good. Um, uh, there's a, a nice paper, a 2011 collection, I think it's called The Metaphysics of the Incarnation, the collected flying essays, Robin Fatima, uh says, well, wait a minute. Um, yeah, we, we, we can make sense out of multiple incarnations, so why not suppose that every one of us is God incarnate, right? That would be the least arbitrary. And this was not a friendly suggestion. <laughs> he doesn't buy into Christian theology, but he's, he's, it's an attempt at a reductio, yeah. saying this, this would be the least arbitrary, and so you want to embrace this. Uh, I think uh, there's a good reason to resist that, which is um, there is a unity to the human community. I mean, I think that would be motivated only to the extent that we wanted to say that uh, the real, the very real empirical, cultural, and other forms of boundaries that divide human beings need to be um, forever, you know, respected, right? Um, and uh, I, I think it's a, it's very runs very deep in, in Christian theology that human beings are are all members of one community. Potentially, we're divided, deeply divided community, but that God created us to be as a community and ultimately desires us to experience community. I, I thought the reason why that it is then 
problematic to then, to then go to the other extreme and just say, well, however many such species there are, one incarnation suffices for all is because uh, if, if the kinds of, of creature kinds were sufficiently radically distinct in nature, then it seems like real community from across those, those bounds would, would be impossible. It would be a very thin kind of notion of community. Um, yeah. It sounded like there's one center of subjectivity and agency that is unique to the second person of the Trinity. Yes. And then the way you kind of incorporate uh, other natures into that is by like adding spheres of thought into that center. So I'm kind of thinking like about this. Well, you incorporate the entire nature. Jesus, uh, how the sun becomes embodied. He becomes okay. an embodied thing, right? Um, it, but, but at the very least, like, but, so but in addition, right? Happens, right? Yeah. So, but at the very least, you've got this like sphere of distinctively human thought that is somehow being incorporated yeah. into the center of subjectivity and agency. Let's suppose also that you know, much more surprise, um, he's also incarnated as dolphins. So there's a sphere of dolphin thought also in the center. And so I guess I'm just trying to figure out, like, in what sense do the different <coughs> spheres, because the, if, the, if there's multiple incarnation, there are a whole bunch of spheres that are incorporated into the center but are distinct from one another. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, what keeps the centers separate? And then in what sense are they part? Sorry, what keeps the... Sphere separate, worship of what? They all count as part okay, good. of what are the same. Right. Um, so uh, forget about incarnation. Okay. Think about the idea of an omniscient God that knows the thoughts of all creatures that have thoughts. So we've got Hannah um, praying for a child uh, to God at the same time as you know, some other um, uh, human individuals crying out to God. God's aware and in, 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 uh, interacting with these. Uh, individuals differentially or corresponding to their distinct circumstances, right? So God's kind of keeping track of two very different sort of things, but he's doing it simultaneously. And then what's distinctive about the idea of the incarnation is that God is has is becomes these individuals, these human individuals, not solely human uh, other creaturely individuals, but in part he is these individuals. Um, so what he's doing is he's choosing to interact differentially, say, with the human body of Jesus of Nazareth, such that um, as that body matures, right, knowledge is built up in the usual way, right? So the five-year-old Jesus knew very little compared to the 20-year-old Jesus and so forth. Um, and he, he stays within those restrictions, right? But he initiates response. He, he, he engages as the five-year-old with his, his, his parents, let's say. He engages as the 20-year-old with, with others in ways appropriate to a five-year-old and a 20-year-old. That is, he doesn't bring to bear his omniscience uh, and, uh, as, as, uh, in deciding how to interact, okay? And, that, and then he's simultaneously doing this over here uh, I don't know about dolphins, right? Because uh, I don't, I don't, um, because I, I don't think that they, they're divine image-bearing creatures. But supposing, with, you know, dolphins, dolphins are even more impressive uh, than, than than we think. Uh, I suppose that were so, right? Then then you'd be doing that simultaneously as well. But I don't see a, tra a keeping track kind of issue problem. And, and it seems to me either you just think the very idea of being the locus of a single human nature that is a full human nature. If you see, if you, you say, I can't grasp that. Okay, I understand. It, it, it is a difficult concept, but but I'm not. You seem to be suggesting bringing on a second nature here uh, brings an added difficulty. I'm not seeing why that should be. I think we have to move on. Sure. This might be related to Collins. So, and it might just be clarifying. So, let let's call. Uh, 
Wolf Hartwig. Let's call Christ incarnate in this world, Jesus one. Jesus and, one. Yeah. Okay. And let's call Christ incarnate in another world, Jesus two. And my question is just is is Jesus one identical to Jesus two or not? <coughs> if if Jesus one is identical to Jesus two, then it seems like we violate the discernibility of identicals. Um, if they're not identical, then um, I don't see how both can be identical to the to Christ. Right. Uh, yes, they are identical. Uh, assuming, as would be natural, since you use the personal term Jesus, you're referring to the person Jesus one. The person Jesus one is identical to the person. Jesus help, help me out with terminology. Okay, no, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, but but then you that. say, yeah, but what about that? That purely just I'm focusing solely and entirely on the physical thing over here and the physical thing over there. Are they identical? The answer no. But they're parts of one thing. They are two two distinct physical, wholly but, distinct physical and, parts and this of is why one person. Related to cause. I mean, isn't incarnate Christ supposed to be one thing? Yes. One and then so there's one thing that's incarnate Christ in one world and another thing that's incarnate Christ in another world. And it looks like it's the same thing. It's, it's but it looks like they have different natures, right? Insofar as that's they're right. unified. Right. And then you think, well, how can they be identical with different Good. natures? Good. But I mean, right, so now we stick to single incarnation case, we're saying one thing, two natures, divine and human. Uh, but I think it's a different and then, and then okay, yeah. but and then we go multiple incarnation, we say one thing, divine and multiplicity of creaturely nature. Still one thing, one person. Right? One substance. Is one person, which is multiply. Now, why is it a, why is it a, a, a different uh, problem? Because you're saying, well, we've got when you say the indiscernibility uh, or the, uh, of, of identicals. They are the, the one person. There, there, there's no violation of that. That one person is there. The one person is there. Okay. The one person is raising his left hand at the same time as the one person is raising his other right hand, <laughs> right hand of his other nature. <laughs> you got to work harder to, to generate a contradiction. Maybe there's one lurking here. But I don't or, or maybe there's one to begin with. <laughs> okay. okay, we still have seven people in the queue, but we're out of time, so let's take a second.